It's 24. And your branch of service? The United States Marine Corps. Okay. And what was your highest rank, Lynn? It was E5, Sergeant. Okay. And just kind of briefly, in what general locations did you serve during your, your time in the Marines? It was basically in the European theater. We were the 2nd Marine Division out of North Carolina, and we did med cruises and under NATO command, and we spent most of our time in different countries in Europe. The countries included Spain, Italy, Turkey, Greece, and it was all of our NATO, other NATO allies in that, in that area. Okay. And then uh, after Europe, you went to, where did you serve after that? You went to? In Europe, after Europe, I was stationed in Keflavik, Iceland for one year. Okay. Okay. Um, so were you uh, drafted or did you enlist? I enlisted. Enlisted, okay. And where were you living at the time of your enlistment? Yeah. During my... At the time that you actually enlisted? Be Sharon, Connecticut. In Sharon, Connecticut? Yes, I was born in Sharon, I was born in Sharon, okay. Do you remember your, your first days? You, where did you go for basic training? And do you remember your, your first days in basic training? And, and yes, kind of tell me what the experience was like for you. Well, it was considered uh, it was in Paris Island, South Carolina. Mm -hmm. And I remember the tr train ride very well. I was going down there. And I was fresh off the farm in Connecticut. And here I was going to uh, my first experience in the military. We heard lots of stories about it on the way down there, and lo and behold, it was true. Yeah. Yes, it was. It was a. It was. A, it was a very. It was quite an experience, and uh, they definitely made a marine out of you. But it all helped in the end. I mean, they were there for one reason: that's to save you, save your life, mm -hmm. mostly in combat. Uh, I remember my first duty station right out of basic was. We were, we were going to be going on a med cruise on NATO, and we were diverted almost immediately to uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Mm -hmm. now, thank God nothing really happened there too quickly. And from there, we went on to Europe, and that was my, basically my first experience okay. under the military. Okay. Was your basic training also your AIT or job training? Did you, what was your job? And my you job was there? basically a rifleman. It was an 0300 series. Okay. And it was a rifleman or anti-tank. They give you an MOS, what they call the term MOS, mm -hmm. which means what you do in the service at while you're there. And they assign you these, these certain duties. Yes. Okay. And what was the, what was your training like to be a rifleman? What what type of training did you get? Did you receive? Do you remember any specific things from your training in that? Well, it was <laughs> lots of firing, a lot of gunfire, mm -hmm. and. Uh, and it was basically, uh, it was, um, how can I describe this? Uh, the training was, was for your good, how to make you survive. And, and they put you in positions that you'd be in, hopefully, and that you could survive. And then you would help your fellow Marine beside you and help him survive. Mm -hmm. okay. um, now, I want to ask you, did you pick the Marines, or how did you decide, you know, Marines, Army, Navy, Air Force, how did you decide? I remember it was in high school, mm -hmm. and uh, I originally was going to think, thinking about the Air Force and graduating from high school. Well, lo and behold, the Marine recruiter came into our high school and used in stress blues like I'm in now, mm -hmm. and that was it. Mm -hmm. I said, I'm going to be a Marine. I've always heard things about the Marines, and it was, I had four other comrades in, in school in high school and joined with me, and uh, I'm the last one left. Uh, they, have, they have since passed. Yes. Um, did you have any, any mementos? Uh, any, what, what got you through your basic training? Did you have any, anything to help you relieve stress? You know, some people have like a, a rabbit's foot or a, picture of their girlfriend or, or whatever. Did you have anything that you kind of turned to to help you stay grounded, deal with the stress? Stay grounded. It was mostly girlfriends back home. Yeah. That was basically 
what it was. And I was fortunate enough to be in a position where I could take the term they use is R&R, &R, mm -hmm. and that's rest and relaxation. And those cities or towns were close by. And uh, like Europe was a great place. <laughs> a lot of different places. A lot of people. So after your basic training, after your training to be a rifleman, you, you headed to Europe. So that is correct. Tell me about some of your experiences. Experience there. You weren't necessarily stationed on land in Europe. You, you kept doing the what, port of call, is that what they called it? Or? It's port of call, because we the Marine Corps is part of the Navy. Mm -hmm. Like I explained, the six, I was with the Sixth Fleet, and was, the Sixth Fleet is based in the Atlantic and Mediterranean. And they always have a battalion of Marines on their convoy. And it's to go to certain trouble spots. They're always on patrol there, and they're radioed in if they have a trouble spot in some other country, especially a NATO country. And we go to their aid until the help arrives in full combat yeah. here. And uh, so, what was life like aboard the boat? I'm mean, aboard the ship. What kind of ship were you on, and what was your daily routine? The first ship I was on was an LST. It was a landing craft. It's flat bottom. I went across the North Atlantic with that. That was quite a trip. You're going up, damn, flat bottoms, terrible. Second trip was the Francis Marion, much, much nicer ship and uh, better living conditions. And my third trip was with an aircraft carrier. And again, it was a good, it was a good ship. It was, it was accommodations were much better. Yeah. The first trip was the toughest on the, on the LST, Waukegan County. She was an old ship and uh, lots of experiences on her. And it was the LS, what was the name again? An LST. It's a landing craft. In fact, I use my hands here. It's, yeah. it's flat bottom and it goes right into the beach. Right. And the, the whole front of the ship opens up and you come out. And you come out with uh, either on tanks or, or carries. Or mm -hmm. But it also, I remember, was the first experience of my first trip. Is They opened these doors in the water and they were called landing craft. They had no Mathematically, these things are not supposed to float and are on, and you go in, you're right off into the ocean, you're underwater, and the water's pouring in on you, and up you come, you say, oh, and that goes in, the, the Navy pilot, and he goes into the beach, and he drives right up in the beach with it, it was a landing craft. Uh, I try and remember the name, the name, I, mm -hmm. but, and then, then we had the experience of using regular landing craft with, with ships, with small craft boats, where they, the front drops off mm -hmm. into the beach. It was all beach uh, type of combat situations. And that's the type of uh, landings we would do uh, on the helicopters. Uh, carry, we used helicopters. Mm -hmm. And we went off the helicopter, we went inland, and they dropped us off that way. These were different methods they used to get us on the beachhead, wherever it needed to be. Okay. We did these maneuvers, and then we went on to a Liberty Port where we had a little R&R. &R. Mm -hmm. You remember some of those ports? Remember the ports, yes. Uh, like I said, Barcelona was a favorite, and uh, Naples, Italy was the first. I'd like to just talk, mention that one. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that was on my first trip to Europe, and it was like the indoctrination uh, of Europe to me. We'd never been on, we were on a small, small boats being landed on in Naples, the city of Naples, and small craft, and uh, it was like maybe 20 of us on a, on a boat and get off. I remember this long uh, field, like uh, like a dock, and on the other end of it were these high fences. And there was people on the other side, hundreds of people. I said, wow, what an introduction to Europe. You know, the, these people were yelling, so we couldn't hear what they were saying. And we got to the, uh, to the gates. We found out what all those cheering people were. <laughs> It was, hey, Joe, do you want to go to a nicer place? Uh, plenty of girls uh, and plenty uh, of yeah. girls. And, and it ended up there were mostly pimps and prostitutes. Yeah. But wow, what an indoctrination to Europe. But that was my indoctrination to it, my first protocol. Mm -hmm. There was others that were much better. Yeah. That was my first one. It stands out. So what were some of the others? Well, some of the others were like on, on some of the landings we did. On the, uh, we do a liberty call, like, like I explained in, in Naples, where they give you a few days off. Then we go to a landing, uh, a landing site where we do maneuvers, and I remember being dropped off by a helicopter in one, and it, it was at night, and in the morning when we woke up, it was all fog, and we didn't know where the heck we were, and the fog rose, and we were right in the middle 
with an orange and lemon grove. It was beautiful. <laughs> and uh, it was pretty cool. We filled our packs with the oranges and the lemons and off we went. <laughs> but that was one of the better experiences. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and you, you personally, you yourself didn't see any, any uh, combat, is that right? No, okay. I did not see any combat. I never put a foot on in Vietnam. It was during the Vietnam era, but the 2nd Marine Division, its duty was with Europe and NATO, and that was my job. And that's what I was called on to do, and that's what I did. Okay. If they wanted to send me there, they would have, or I right. would have. All that's around. where I was stationed. That's where they sent me. Right. Um, what, was a day, what was a daily routine like aboard ship? I mean, you, I understand the, the, the landing, the beachheads, landing swamp, but day-to-day, uh, -day, it took a long time to get across the ocean, right? Yes, it did. And, uh, and every, most of the time while we were on ship, we just uh, played cards a lot. Yeah. We talked, and we had lots of uh, physical fitness programs mm -hmm. to keep us in shape, either up or down below on the under deck. But uh, they kept trying to keep us in shape that way. And that was pretty much the, I remember the card games. Yeah. I remember that. I don't think that's changed any. I have to, probably hasn't. Rolling of the dice. <laughs> Do you, uh, you, uh, after your, your time doing the beachhead exercises and so on through long Europe and so on, where did you go next? In well, I was, we came back to Camp Lejeune. We spent our three month tour. And again, the exchange was made. Another battalion of Marines took our place, mm -hmm. and we came home. He said, it was always a battalion of Marines in the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. So we came home to Camp Lejeune. And uh, I was called in one day, and uh, I was called in by my, my uh, company commander, and he said that uh, we have an opening in Iceland, Keflavik Iceland. And I said, oh, Keflavik Iceland, it was guard duty. And he said, would you like to go? I said, fine. I said, I'm, I'm glad to try to do that. So they sent me to Catholic High School for one year in the guard detachment. We was under NATO again, and we're guarding the, uh, the, Marine, the uh, Naval Air Station in Catholic and lots of radar sites, which were all set up for NATO in the Cold War, mm -hmm. and we secured that site. They always kept it for the one year. The barracks were beautiful. It was Navy. Ten-inch, I mean, were ten-inch mattresses and great food and we had the drapes over the windows and that was for the midnight sun because you remember we were on that in that latitude where you had you didn't have a night sometimes it was daytime all the time so <laughs> you really couldn't tell what time of day it was unless you looked at the, at the clock or your watch that's unique it was that's unique, unique. Yeah. and uh i took one experience a couple of mm -hmm. experiences there mm -hmm. I remember it was my first exposure to the uh, Northern Lights. I was on guard duty and, and I looked up in the sky and I saw this. It was like what I could explain to you is it's like the candy, the Christmas ribbon candy, different colors, and they're flashing along the top of the skyline. I mean, it was quite a sight. That was my experience with the, uh, the Northern Lights. And of course, the first tour of the Ivy Night, that was when President Kennedy was assassinated. And that's where I was. I was at Keflavik like Iceland in the guard post alone, in a guard tower overlooking a radar station. I'll always remember that sad day. Mm -hmm. But that's where I was. And uh, so you remember everybody's, what the impact was on everybody when hearing of, of Kennedy's Mostly death? surprise. Mm -hmm. Couldn't believe that it happened. And uh, we all took a good heart. But we were ready to do what we were told to do. We didn't know it was during the Cold War. If the other countries would take advantage of this, I don't. We didn't know. It was just a very sad time. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, in uh, Iceland, you were, for the most part, you were guard duty. That is correct. No, no, it was either a guard post or in a vehicle. And um, the R and R there, I can explain to you, it was a very unique thing. We have a small high school here back in Connecticut. It's Housatonic Valley Regional High School, and we have an exchange student program. And guess where our exchange student came from that time? 
Keflavik, Reykjavik, Iceland. Oh, really? <laughs> I went over and I saw her and met her, and we had good times to get with her and her family. And, uh, but that was a very unique thing, having one person out of your, your small life back home, being right there in Reykjavik, Iceland. Oh, my gosh. It's amazing. Amazing it was. A small world. Yes, it is. <laughs> okay. Um, anything else in, in uh, Iceland? Anything that sticks out that was yeah, well, it was interesting? A couple, or... Two other things. I made a trip to Glasgow, Scotland. Again, that was one of those R and R trips. And from there, I went to uh, Glasgow, Scotland, and for a few days and met the folks there. And uh, it was again, it was a very unique time, and a very good time, partying most of the time. And one of my last experiences there was waking up one morning and it was the ground was shaking. We didn't know what the heck had happened. We were, it ended up, it was, it was a volcano that had erupted just off the coast of Kefalik, no more than five miles out offshore. Came right up out of the sea in the lava and it was just such a sight. We went over to the air station, they were Navy air station there, and we had met some friends there that they, uh, Navy pilots, and they said, would you like to take a trip? over that volcano. We said, sure. We jumped on a twin-engine uh, old cargo plane and off we went and we flew right over the volcano. Wow. And, and it was, that was a very unique experience. I had never seen a volcano before. I was in 1963. I was, eight, I was 19 years old. But that was one of my last experiences in Iceland. And this was an underwater volcano? Yeah, underwater volcano. It came up and it made an island. It, it formed an island, another island, it was just, and the lava coming out, and the red, and, oh, and the steam. <laughs> and it was like five or six miles offshore, but we got our closest look from the plane. And these Navy pilots are really <laughs> courageous yeah. and a little uh, whatever. And they came pretty close to a few of those signs. We managed to get a few pictures of it you know, that I had. Wow. So, after a, a year in Iceland, you left Iceland with, uh, I don't know, what do you call it, PCS? Or you, you left from Iceland to go where? I went back to Camp Lejeune. Again, I was 2nd Battalion, 8th Marines, my whole tour in the service. And went back to Camp Lejeune. Mm -hmm. And we do exercises there too. We do pretty much the same type of thing, military maneuvers as that. Uh, rifle range and different weapons and this and that. But uh, I was called into the office again. And my company commander said, I have an opening, another opening for you. How would you like to be a part of the uh, presidential detail in Quantico, Virginia, for the president of the United States? I said, wow, I'm game for that. I said, <laughs> I'm fine. Again, it was, you know, it was, it was different things. They had to be a certain height. I mean, there's certain probably regulations that came in that chose me. So I went to, uh, I was restationed to uh, Quantico, Virginia. And there's where Quantico is. That's where the uh, Marine, uh, War Marine one is. And uh, it's along with the Officers Candidate School for the Marine Corps there and the FBI Academy. And we belonged, while I was waiting, I had to have a White House clearance. And to get this White House clearance, you had to wait around a little bit. So we were, we were sent to this, uh, a different a squadron there that uh, that helped train the Marine officers coming into the uh, to the Marine Corps. And while we were waiting for our next duty station, or for me personally, it was waiting for my White House clearance to come through. Uh, we trained officers to be, and uh, and finally, after two months, uh, it took like two months, and. Uh, I was finally st sent over to the Marine Corps HMX-1 presidential helicopter. And it was, it was right on in Quantico, it was barracks, and it was a tremendous, right next to this humong humongous uh, hangar. And inside that hangar were four Marine One helicopters. And our duties there, can I go ahead with it? Yeah, no, yeah. Well, my Please duty do. there was, well, there was presidential duty, this was the, the dress blue routine, and there was also the 24-hour watch of those helicopters and those hangars. And uh, it was quite an experience. And uh, President Johnson was the president at the time. And uh, he was a good man. 
And then, so, did you fly in those helicopters at all? Yeah, or were we you did fly a bit, mostly, mostly a few times I did. And uh, it was quite an experience. And, uh, whew, well, where can I go from there? It's not too much I can really talk about the, yeah. the installation and stuff because right. even today, you know, what was on board those helicopters, the weapons we had, uh, uh, you know, it was a White House clearance type of thing we were told. Right. We really not to talk about that too much. Okay. And, well, but it was very, it was, it was very, it was a very good duty. It was, it was a very honorable for me to do that. Definitely. Especially for the president. Did you ever have the opportunity to fly with the president? On one occasion. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Yes. Okay. And then I was there right for there? a short time. It wasn't a long time because it came up to that. My, my duty was coming up to an end. Mm -hmm. They wanted me to stay in terribly. And uh, it was called the tournament that he was shipping over. And uh, they put the money on the table. And, but I was interested in going back, going to school, mm -hmm. for my education and go on. So, so then, how long were you there then at Quantico? Well, was there approximately... With, with HMX1, approximately one year, just under a year. Okay. Waiting to get in the clearance and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So, after that year, that ended well, along with your, your, your service in active duty? Yes, it ended by my, my, my active duty. Okay. That's, that's a good way to end active service. Yes, it was. Yes. It's a very honorable way. Yes. So, do you remember? Uh, your last days in the military, going home, do uh, you remember how that was, was it? Yes, I remember going back, and I drove back, it was in Virginia, I had my own car at the time, I had a car. And I was going back to Sharon, Connecticut, and uh, my girlfriend was in Canaan, <laughs> and, uh, and she was at the, uh, I believe the University of Boston. I remember I went to Boston first to see her, mm -hmm. and then I went home to see my, uh, my mom, my father passed away when I was like 12 years old, mm -hmm. so he wasn't there. But I went back uh, home after, and was, was seeing old, old school friends and, uh, and then writing up uh, applications to get into college, to different schools. Mm -hmm. So I was busy doing that. So you went back to college. Um, did you have the GI Bill, or how? Yes, I had the GI Bill. I went to Pace College in New York City, and that was quite an experience there in the city. And, uh, and the GI Bill didn't help as much as it does some of the gentlemen today. It helps a little bit more today. At the time, it was it was rather minimal, so I had to take up an, another job. I drove a taxi cab in New York City. Oh, I, really? I, quite an experience. <laughs> I finished my school up, up at night. Oh, okay. What did you study? What was what was your what did you study at college? What was your career? What did you? Do? Oh, I was social uh, sociology, believe it or not. Oh, okay, okay, sociology. You started out with accounting and changed to sociology. It was had to do a lot with the times you were growing up in the late sixties and early seventies, mm -hmm. and that was seemed like the thing to do at the time. It was a very uh, trying times in our in our history. Those. 60s, late 60s, early 70s. Did you experience any any neg any of those, uh, negative negativity when you were when you got home? Because you were a service member. Well, they home? told us not to wear our uniforms home. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, it was from had atti certain attitudes from certain people that didn't uh, particularly care what was going on in Vietnam at the time. Um, this is. I mean, later on, it, it came to date. That they were blaming us because that's the only way they could unleash themselves, I guess, mm -hmm. if they saw a man in uniform. We weren't, we were being sent over there on to do a duty, to do a job, and we were doing what the country asked us to do. And we weren't to blame for that. We were doing what we were supposed to do. Yeah. But we were their easy targets. So it was recommended that we don't wear the uniforms because they had some bad experiences with it. So, unfortunately, that's the way it was at those, during those times. Um, so your, your service, you finished up your, your service, you went in the reserves, you stayed in the, in the Marine Reserves for a couple of years. Yes. yes. And uh, what were you doing? Did you get started on a career once you finished college? Did you go on to a career or? 
I started with a career, mm -hmm. and I ended up getting married. Okay. And, uh, and then my, my adventure started there. It's, uh, I became a commercial fisherman in oh. Long Island. And that's because that's where my wife was from. And uh, that's, I didn't use the college. I, I didn't use it. I didn't use that degree for anything. Wow. And from there, I, I did go on to uh, work for different schools out there, two different schools. You know, it was Rocky Point and uh, schools and uh, Mount Sinai School District. I spent 17 years on those two schools. Doing with them. As, and, a, uh, as doing what? As a teacher or? No, I was in charge of their buildings and grounds. Oh, okay. Yeah. And uh, I always had good friends. I mean, they always did a work good job. I appreciated that. But commercial fishing was probably my, my most favorite because it was what I enjoyed doing. And to enjoy something and making a living at it at the same time is a very important thing. Definitely. Definitely. Um, so you've retired, but your activity within uh, with the military or with with with, with service to, to those in the military has continued. Um, are you involved in, in any uh, organizations, uh, VFW, uh, American Legion, any any types of military organizations? Yes, I am. It started when I got right after I was retired. I went to a funeral, a graveside funeral in our, my hometown in Sharon. And performing the ceremony was a military honor guard. And they were from Torrington, here. And I was very impressed with that. And I said, wow, I'd, maybe I'd like to try to do that. So I went and I talked to the gentleman there in charge, and he gave me the number to call. And that's exactly what I did. I called here in Torrington. I ended up joining this honor guard detail. And we do honor guards throughout the Northeast here, throughout this area. And uh, you go as a, it's a, it's a seven man squad. And you go there you say, as, as a rifleman, there's two men up front, and as a bugler. And it's a, it's a very touching thing. Uh, and, uh, just for those who might not know what it, what it what your what it means to be an honor guard. What's the pur what's your purpose as an honor guard? What's the purpose of having honor? It's guard? giving back. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a giving back to a fellow uh, service member, whether he be Army, Navy, Marine Corps, Coast Guard, and you're giving back. He's being buried with an American flag over his coffin, and so that usually means he's being buried with military honors. And with that, as a squad, this is what we participate and do. And uh, touching moments, there's many of them with that. And uh, especially when you're up front and you're giving back, you fold the flag and you present it to a deceased members next to kin. And, uh, and you present it, if I can say these, the words that we present it with, sure. it's very hard to do. And so we were trained at the time not to focus on the eyes of that person, but probably in the middle of their forehead. Because if you both look into their eyes, you see the, the despair in that, and you might choke on it. And so one of the words, the words that I say, especially for on, on a Marine funeral, would be, on behalf of the President of the United States, Commandant of the Marine Corps, and a very grateful nation, please accept this flag as a token for your husbands honorable service to his country. December 5, and you get the salute. And with that moment, it's, it's a very touching moment. And uh, I remember with the Torrent Group most recently, it was a, a very special moment. It was an army funeral of a Korean War veteran. And uh, we were up front, and uh, not only we had, there was a request made by the deceased member's family, and it was like the the grandfather of seven grandchildren that he had. They were all there at that funeral. And the request was, not only does my daughter get the, the flag that was draped over the coffin, but each of my seven grandchildren were to receive one flag piece. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wow. It's amazing. It's 
well, that was one of those moments. Mm -hmm. There's been many of them since. And, uh, I uh, think that's giving back. This is the part I enjoy doing right now. Do you know how many funerals you have been a part of? At present, probably around between about 50 funerals, 50 to 60 funerals. Mm. And maybe uh, 10, 15 wakes, we also do wake services. Mm -hmm. And uh, we also do honor guards for the different uh, holidays and uh, organizational. There's Vietnam Veterans Day, there's the uh, Second War, Second World War. Elements. We do it with the Girl Scouts, the Boy Scouts, mm -hmm. their honor guards. And we try to give back to as much of the community as we possibly can. And these are some of the other organizations I belong to also. And this is with the Sharon VFW and the uh, Bantam Honor Guard in Bantam, Connecticut. And the, uh, of course, the here in Torrington, the Honor Guard here. And uh, trying to think of the last one. <laughs> it's hard to remember all. But I'm, I'm the Commandant of the Marine Corps League's attachment here in Canaan, Connecticut. And uh, it's a give back program. There's people constantly asking you to do certain things for them. And we're glad to do it. Glad to do it. It's, be, it's an honor awesome. to do it. Awesome. Awesome. Um, and, and you've been doing this for how long? Since I retired. Mm -hmm. Since like 2000, uh, 2009. 2002. Um, do you attend any, do you, are there any reunions or from like the, the units you were in or? No. No. There's there, no I do not. I see them in our in some of the military magazines, mm -hmm. but I never really go back to that page or mm -hmm. I scan them time to time. Okay. But uh, there was two. Well, I haven't had any real contact with any of uh, the servicemen other than the ones I meet now, and uh, and of course the ones I went in with. There was four of us, and three never came back. And. Um, I have I stayed with their families. I did their burials. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell me uh, how do you do you think your service in the military affected your future life? How did it impact you and the way that you conducted life after you got out of the service? Do you think it had a great impact? I believe it affected tremendously. Mm -hmm. I mean, it made an honorable person. Anyway. It made camaraderie a very important part of life to me, and and especially when you when you were, before I retired, I wasn't doing these funerals because it wasn't really the time to do. It. You were working and trying to support a family, putting your daughter through college and this and that. But once I retired, I said it's time to give back, and that's what I started to do. And the military had a tremendous impact on that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, certain films and uh, Taking Chances, one of them, Kevin Bacon. I can't recommend that film more. Taking Chances. Taking Chances, it was an HBO movie. And uh, it, it followed a, or oh, you wonder at times today, what happens to all these 20, 30,000 men of divers in Afghanistan and Iraq? What happens to all these men? They're being shipped back to Pennsylvania, to Philadelphia, to the mortuary. Their bodies, mm -hmm. and it showed that. It showed how, in, from there, they're they're taken out and distributed to their hometowns and their different to their hometown mortuary, and they're buried with military honors. And it showed the escort service these servicemen that escort their bodies mm -hmm. back to their hometowns. It's a very touching film, and a very touching moment for me. Well, Glenn, is there anything that you'd like to add that we have not covered? One last thing, I guess, would be my, my dad. He had a lot of, he was in World War I. And he was in combat in France. And he was wounded. And received medals, of course. 
and uh, but he never received the Purple Heart. And the Purple Heart at the time was not being issued to World War One veterans. It wasn't until 19, it was 2006 that they recognized World War One veterans. They were wounded to receive the Purple Heart. But what you had to supply were the medical records, discharges, military papers. Again, my dad had died when I was 12. And uh, he never talked too much about it. But my mother kept all these records, and it's very fortunate that she did. Because in 2009, 10, I gave these, these records to my congressman, Mr. Chris Murphy. And he had a lady, Stephanie Podwell. She took care of the Veterans Affairs, and she helped me tremendously. And uh, a year later, it was approved by the President of the United States Congress that my father received the Purple Heart. Nice. That he deserved. Uh, Mr. Murphy was supposed to be at the presentation. It was all set up for a cemetery funeral right by the graveside. My father never received the, uh, the honor guard services either. So I said, wow, let me do this together. Father's Day is coming up. Okay. So I scheduled my command here in, in Toronto with our, our uh, honor squad that they performed the funeral service and that they, and since Mr. Murphy couldn't apply, they couldn't, couldn't present it. He, he, he was trying to reschedule it for the following week, but I just couldn't do it with all the other ends I had to, uh, mm -hmm. to meet to pull this off for Father's Day. And so, Mr. Andrew Rohrbeck came into the picture and he said it would be, be an honor for him to do this on behalf of Mr. Murphy and the president. And we had a uh, graveside funeral and the presentation, graveside in Sharon, Connecticut, our old cemetery. The family was all there, 70, 80 people. The press was there, of course. And uh, it was a beautiful ceremony. Awesome. And this is. And I remember the last thing I said. This was for you, Dad. Happy Father's Day. Hmm. No, it's just. I don't know what you, if you got that last bit. But it was Happy Father's Day. Mm -hmm. This is 53 years after his passing. 53 years after his passing. You made everything right. Yes. And so it was right, the right thing to do. And, uh, and if you ask me about how much the military had to do with my life, it's been a lot. Definitely. I can see that. Yeah. I can. Well, Glenn, I want to thank you for your service, and I want to thank you for the way you're continuing to serve the veterans. And uh, I want to thank you for sitting down with us and talking with us.